Today's episode is brought to you by the Your Brain on Facts book, available now. Want the facts without my voice? Get the Your Brain on Facts book. But if you want my voice without the facts, I am available for hire for voiceover work. No job too small, and my listeners get 50% off. Email me at moxie at yourbrainonfacts.com. It has been the habit of kings throughout the world to hire tasters to test their food, on the off chance some oppressed mass has poisoned it. But Henry VIII cast a wider net with his paranoia. He wanted to be certain no one was going to poison him transdermally either, meaning through the skin. He ordered that every morning the servant who changed the king's sheets had to kiss every part of the sheets, pillows, and blankets that they had touched to prove they hadn't smeared poison on them. They also had to test for poison on the cushion of his son Edward's chamber pot, though the historic record doesn't say how. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. The term Mad King re-entered the common lexicon a few years back thanks to George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire books. We have more than enough examples from Europe alone to choose from. George III, born in 1738, was the English king who lost the American colonies. Though anti-monarchists would record stories of bizarre behavior, like George mistaking an oak tree for Frederick the Great, the king really did have mental health problems that manifested themselves in different periods of his life. During these times, he suffered from insomnia and talked incessant nonsense for hours. It was not uncommon for a single sentence to contain 400 words. It has long been suspected that King George suffered from porphyria, a genetic metabolic disorder that causes depression, hallucinations, constipation, purple urine, and severe abdominal pain. However, as will come up frequently today, new evidence and theories undermine that original thinking. One of the medicines the king was treated with was gentian, This plant, with its deep blue flowers, is still used today as a mild tonic that may turn the urine blue. His incessant loquacity, as it was called, and his habit of talking until foam ran from his mouth are features that can be seen today in patients with extreme cases of mania from psychiatric illnesses such as bipolar disorder. Besides benign-sounding herbal treatments, King George would be restrained in a chair with iron straps for hours. He was also bled, forced to vomit, and starved, suffering under the humoral or four humors school of medicine. A recent study based on the examination of King George's hair shows high levels of arsenic, which was administered to him as part of the cure, but would have served to only worsen his symptoms. In the last 10 years of his life, his son and heir, George IV, served as regent. Fans of the show Blackadder will remember George IV as brilliantly portrayed by Hugh Laurie opposite the titular Rowan Atkinson character. A somewhat annoying little side note, when the play The Madness of George III was made into a film in 1994, the title was changed to The Madness of King George. Why? For fear that American audiences would think it was a sequel and wouldn't go to see it because they hadn't seen the first two. When your business is running countries and even whole empires, you want to keep that in the family. And the best way to ensure that is to make sure everybody marries somebody they're already related to. When you say it like that, it doesn't sound like such a good plan. But that was how royal houses conducted themselves for centuries to ensure they retained their fortunes in the days before even a basic understanding of genetics. When close relatives reproduce, it increases their offspring's chances of being affected by deleterious recessive traits for all kinds of physical and cognitive disabilities, including things like hemophilia and cystic fibrosis, as well as deformities like the Habsburg jaw. These ancestral pairings also run a greater risk of reduced fertility higher infant mortality, congenital birth defects, certain kinds of cancer, suppressed immune systems, and overall smaller adult size, a condition referred to as 
pedigree collapse. Some royal families kept things closer knit than others. Maria I of Portugal married her father's younger brother, Pedro, when she was 26 and he was 43. Their son and heir, Joseph, married his aunt, Maria's sister, Benedita. Therefore, Pedro's daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, and niece were the same person. Joseph was 15 when he married, and Benedita was 30. Charles II of Spain is said to have been more inbred than if his parents had been full siblings. His ancestor, Joanna of Castile, renamed by many Juana the Mad, appears in his family tree no less than 14 times because of first and second cousin intermarrying, and his father was his mother's uncle. Emperor Franz II of Austria married Maria Therese, his double first cousin, meaning they had the same four grandparents. One of the most famous monarchs to sport the long Habsburg jaw was the aforementioned Charles of Spain, who may have had double copies of as many as a quarter of his genes. Charles II's mandibular prognathism, the medical term for it, was so pronounced that it was said he could not chew his food well and that the size of his tongue caused him to drool often. He was feeble-minded and didn't learn to talk until he was four or walk until he was eight. His family largely skipped educating him. There didn't seem to be much of a point. As an adult, his speech was so poor that he was, for the most part, entirely unintelligible. In an arguable silver lining, Charles was also sterile. Over in France, another Charles, Charles IV, left a lasting contribution to history with a namesake psychiatric condition, usually referred to as glass delusion. Sufferers believe that they are made of glass and in danger of shattering at the slightest touch. Charles IV refused to allow people to touch him. He would have iron rods sewn into his clothing to reinforce himself and would constantly be wrapped in thick blankets so that his buttocks wouldn't splinter when he sat down. He had other problems, too. He would fall into periods where he would forget that he was the king, that he had a wife and children. He would even forget his own name. He was known to run through the palace howling like a wolf. It's now believed by many that Charles probably suffered from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or encephalitis, an inflammation of the brain. His doctors tried to cure him by drilling small holes in his head. Inevitably, and not surprisingly, that treatment didn't work, and Charles' son-in-law was declared regent to rule in his stead. A glass piano was at the center of the delusion of Princess Alexandra of Bavaria 300 years later. She believed she had swallowed it when she was a child, and that it was still inside her. I feel like that bears repeating. She believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. It's entirely possible that whatever condition caused that delusion, along with a fixation on cleanliness, was hereditary, as her nephew, King Ludwig II, who had more than his fair share of eccentricities, also had glass delusion. Ludwig would show his people that even an amusing mad king can still be a harmful one. He was obsessed with Wagner's opera, Lonegrin, in which a swan leads a knight to a damsel in distress. And King Ludwig ordered a castle to be built and to be decorated entirely in swans, in which he would watch full performances of Lonegrin, hiding behind a curtain in an empty theater. Ludwig actually became more eccentric as he aged, separating himself from dinner guests with a wall of flowers, having a coach driver take him around the grounds in circles and pretending he was on holiday, moving about only at night to avoid other people, and ordering people to be executed for coughing or sneezing in his presence, which right now doesn't seem as unreasonable, but he never followed through with those orders. The lavish castle, the empty opera theaters, the massive banquets, were all well and good when Ludwig was spending his own private fortune, 
but he ran through all that and started dipping into the public treasury, as well as begging and borrowing from other countries. Soon after, Ludwig was declared insane. He was sent to a smaller palace at Berg with the official psychiatrist, where both would be found dead in a lake just a few hours after arriving. Many have speculated that Ludwig killed the doctor then himself, but we'll never really know what happened. Bleeding a country dry is one problem. Actually bleeding is quite another. Hemophilia, a medical condition in which the ability of the blood to clot is severely reduced, and sufferers can bleed severely from even the slightest injury, was very common in European royalty. One monarch in particular is to blame for injecting it into the bloodlines, the grandmother of modern Europe, the dower and proper Queen Victoria, who herself married a cousin. That she inherited the gene for hemophilia from her father, Prince Edward, is widely speculated, but what is definitely known is what happened to her children and their descendants. Her son Leopold and grandson Frederick both died from cerebral hemorrhages from falls that should not have been fatal. Grandson Valdemar died while awaiting a blood transfusion, and his younger brother Heinrich died at age four after a fall. Two great-grandsons died in what should have been survivable car accidents, if not for the inability of their blood to clot. Hemophilia was one of the reasons the mad monk Rasputin had been able to curry such favor with Tsarina Alexandra of Russia, granddaughter of Queen Victoria, wife of Nicholas II, and mother to Olga, Tatiana, Maria, Anastasia, and little Alexei. The court doctors had failed to help Alexei, particularly when they gave him the miracle cure of the day, aspirin. Aspirin has blood-thinning effects, which is the very last thing a hemophiliac needs. When the modern medicines failed, Tsarina Alexandra turned to faith, wherein she met Grigory Rasputin. In separating Alexei from the doctors who were inadvertently making him worse, it looked to the Tsarina as if the monk was actually healing her son. Thus, he was able to stay close to the royal family, despite his debauched reputation that included tales of him exposing himself in public and bragging that the Tsar had let him have his way with the Tsarina whenever he fancied. While I'll save the story of Rasputin's murder for another show, and such a story it is, I do want to take a moment to talk about Grand Duchess Anastasia. Even before Fox Animation Studio made the musical cartoon about her, people had been fascinated by the possibility of the two youngest Romanov children escaping the brutal murder of their family by the Red Guard early on the morning of July 17, 1918. Over the years, many people have claimed to be Anastasia and Alexei. So many, in fact, that Wikipedia has an entire page listing out the imposters. One woman, Anna Anderson would maintain the charade for over 60 years. The hopes that some members of the family had survived were bolstered with the 1991 revelation that nine bodies of Romanov family members and servants had been found in a mass grave, but one daughter and one son were still missing. However, DNA evidence from a second nearby grave discovered in 2007 proved that the bones were of the last two Romanov children. Sorry, y'all, but hey, we can still belt out once upon a December together. Many inbred royals died at relatively young ages, though the term boy king should bring a certain person to mind. Recreations from MRIs and genetic testing have shown that the face and body of Tutankhamun bore precious little resemblance to the glorious golden coffin lid we all can picture. Tut's parents were full brother and sister, which does not lay out a good genetic plan for long, healthy life. In fact, Tut ruled for only 10 years, dying at age 19 from an infected femur fracture. Described as a weak, frail boy by Karsten Pusch, a geneticist at Germany's University of Tübingen, Tut had a club foot from a painful condition called Kohler disease and required a cane to walk. He had caught multiple strains of malaria during his life, 
which would have weakened him even further. Recent scans have shown that he had womanly hips and a pronounced overbite, and there's even evidence pointing to epilepsy. Tut's skull had an elongated shape, but this was not congenital. It was a common practice in Egyptian royalty to bind the soft skulls of babies in order to shape them for reasons that are still unclear to archaeologists and anthropologists. No written records describing the practice have survived, leading some to deduce that it was knowledge not meant for common eyes. As with lotus feet of upper-class Chinese women, it was likely reserved for only the highest-ranking people. Skull shaping was a more common practice than you might think. There's evidence of it from among many other examples, the Mayas, Incas, Paracas of Peru, the Chinook and Choctaw of North America, the Lucayan people of the Bahamas, Australian Aborigines, as well as the Huns and other Eastern Germanic tribes, and evidence of skull binding goes back as far as the Neanderthals. You may see these skulls in documentaries, which I can't put big enough bunny ears around, wherein the fanciful and gullible like to refer to them as proof of extraterrestrial life on Earth. They are not. But if you like your history with a heaping side of the weird, you've got to check out the sponsor for today's show, The Mystified Podcast. Fellow lover of weird facts, Tasha Dreadful, is joined by collector of all things dark, Steve Chaos, to tell you stories of the strange and the creepy that are going to make your brain tingle and your skin crawl. You can check out Mystified on your favorite podcast player or by going to mystifiedpod.com. One way to avoid making a puddle out of your gene pool would be for a king to have multiple wives or an assortment of consorts and concubines. This practice, common in the Middle and Far East, still requires you to be somewhat selective. In Zimbabwe, the Monomotapa kings were firm believers in polygamy, with one king counting over 3,000 wives. However, his preferred main wives were his sisters and even his daughters. Any man who cast his eye on one of the wives or daughters would be put to death. Somewhat south of there in Swaziland, King Maswadi III holds or has held a number of regal distinctions. He became king at age 18, making him the youngest ruling monarch from the time of his coronation in 1986 to the coronation of the King of Bhutan, also 18, in 2006. Maswati should have no real challengers for the distinction of being the monarch with the most siblings, however. His father had 70 wives when he died, left behind a whopping 97 children. Maswati, now in his early 50s, recently married his 15th wife. If he continues to marry at the rate he has and lives to be 83 as his father did, he will have slightly less than half as many wives at 33. Per tradition, his first two wives were chosen for him by national counselors. An interesting twist to the Eurocentric view of marriage, the king only marries his fiancée after she has become pregnant thus proving she can bear children. At last count, Maswati has 23 children. In addition to being the 12th largest landowner in the world, King Maswati III is Africa's last absolute monarch in the sense that he has the power to choose the prime minister and other top government posts. Even though he makes the appointments, he still has to get special advice from the queen mother and council. In matters of cabinet appointments, he gets advice from the Prime Minister. As of this writing, he has not restored the nation's parliament, which had been dissolved by his father, in order to ensure a concentration of power on the throne. Maswati and his mother, Nathfambi Latfala, whose title literally means Great She-Elephant, but is meant to mean Queen Mother, actually rule jointly. Latfala was further immortalized in 1985 by American artist Andy Warhol, who included her in a gallery entitled Reigning Queens alongside Elizabeth II of England, Beatrice of the Netherlands, and Marguerite II of Denmark. 
royals off their rocker aren't confined to Europe. The crown prince of Korea in the mid-18th century, Prince Sado, had some serious mental health issues, which began showing up when he was around 12. He was afraid of the sky and saw visions of the thunder god, developed a phobia of clothing, beat his eunuchs and raped women of the court, and eventually graduated to just killing random people. This did not sit well with his father, King Yangjo, who did not appreciate the fact that his heir was insane. Perhaps to avoid spilling royal blood, at least literally, the king ordered the prince to be locked in a rice chest. This was done in the palace courtyard, where people claimed they could hear Sato's cries for eight days. Ignoble death can happen to anyone. Yet another Charles II, this one ruled the Kingdom of Navarre from 1343 to 1387, met an ignoble and thoroughly avoidable end. Charles had been very ill, and his physician ordered him to be completely wrapped from neck to toe in linen cloth soaked in brandy. One of the doctor's attendants was sewing up the cloth so that it would be nice and tight. When she finished the last stitch, she could not find her scissors to cut the thread. She decided instead to just burn through it with the flame of a nearby candle. The linen, soaked in brandy, caught instantly, and the poor king went up in flames. But wait, there's more! Charles VIII of France died after hitting his head on a door frame at an indoor tennis match in 1498. Bela I of Hungary died in September of 1063, when his throne collapsed. Henry I of England ruled with an iron fist, but had a real weakness when it came to eating lampreys, despite his doctor's protests. He overindulged so much one day in November of 1135 that his health declined within a matter of days. Viking Earl Sigmund Einstein's son died in 892 from an infected scratch on his leg. It got there from the teeth of a decapitated enemy head that was swinging from his saddle horn. 25-year-old Alexander of Greece, not the great one, a different one, was walking on his estate in 1920 when his dog got into a fight with a monkey that belonged to a member of his staff. While attempting to break up the fight, a second, different monkey bit Alexander on the leg. The wound became infected and septic. Adolf Frederick of Sweden managed to gorge himself to death in 1771, keeling over after a spread of champagne, lobster, caviar, and kippers, topped off by 14 helpings of his favorite pudding. Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI died in 1740 from eating poisonous mushrooms, presumably by mistake. Always have an expert forager with you if you're going to go picking wild mushrooms. Henry II of France loved a good joust, both watching and participating. In June of 1559, his opponent's lance went right through his eye and into his brain. Nanda Bayin of Burma laughed himself to death in 1599, as did Martin I of Aragon in 1410. Louis III of France died in August of 882 when he hit his head while mounting his horse as he prepared to chase a girl with what we'll say amorous intent. And Attila the Hun, whose name ranks just under Genghis Khan for conquerors, got a nosebleed so severe at his wedding feast that he passed out and choked to death on his own blood. This has been your Daily Dose of Schadenfreude, Royalty Edition. Royal watchers know that close marriage has continued into the modern era, though not nearly as close or as common as it once had been. Longest reigning monarch Queen Elizabeth II is Prince Philip's third cousin via Queen Victoria, and second cousin once removed through King Christian IV of Denmark. There were many connections, such as ladies-in-waiting, mistresses, and godparents, between the royal family and the Spencer family, from which England's rose, Diana, married Princess Charles. Diana had some noble blood, but not enough to be considered royal, so their marriage was considered morganatic, a marriage between people of unequal social rank. William and Kate are distant cousins, extremely distant, 14th cousins once removed through his mother and 15th cousin through his father. 
To be able to consider Harry and Meghan Merkel related, you would have to trace their families back to the 15th century to find a common ancestor. So I, for one, am willing to say that doesn't count. Now, marrying into a royal family might seem like every little girl's dream, but to me, it sounds like a nightmare. Every moment full of rules of protocol. Some of the rules are obvious. When the queen stands up, everybody stands up. They must be gracious when accepting gifts, no matter how strange. Queen Elizabeth had, at one time, and I kid you not, not a word of a lie, six big mouth billy bass that she'd gotten as gifts and actually put up in Balmoral Castle. Six big mouth billy bass and one analogous singing lobster. Anyway, uh, royals are groomed to speak and even to wave exactly properly from early childhood. Some rules, though, are ridiculously specific or so subtle as to barely be noticeable why would we bother, but boy, you sure have to. Wedding bouquets must contain myrtle flowers. Royals must carry with them a funeral-appropriate outfit when traveling, just in case. Heirs to the throne are not allowed to travel together. Right now, William, Kate, and the kids can travel together, but as soon as George turns 12, he and his father will have to take separate flights. Royals aren't allowed to sign autographs or take selfies with you, so please don't ask. They're not allowed to eat shellfish due to higher-than-average risk of food poisoning. The dress code is quite specific. Little George is only to be seen in tailored short pants. Royals should never be seen in casual clothing. Women must wear hats at all formal events until 6 p.m. when married royal women switch to tiaras, which are to be worn in a precise spot and at a precise angle. Even the way they hold their teacup is set down strictly. Royals are to pinch the handle between the index finger and thumb, with the middle finger supporting the bottom. The royal family is also forbidden from playing the board game Monopoly. That is probably not an official edict, but really more of a family rule. Apparently, it gets too vicious when they play. For anyone curious about the line of succession, the crown would not pass to Elizabeth's husband, Prince Philip, upon her death or abdication. It goes to Prince Charles, now 70 years old, then to William, George, Princess Charlotte, Prince Harry, Prince Andrew, and then his daughters. The official list, of course, continues on and on, but the odds of us living to see even two of these people ascend to the throne feel fairly slim, as Queen Elizabeth is still feeling her ginger at age 94. The royal purse actually carries a great deal of weight in day-to-day -day interactions. If Queen Elizabeth moves her purse from her left arm to her right arm, it's a signal to her handlers that they need to get her out of the conversation that she's in. Putting her bag on the floor is a sign that she needs to be extricated from an uncomfortable conversation right now. If she puts her purse on the table at a dinner function, the dinner is to end within the next five minutes. Despite being the figurehead of what was once the greatest nation in the world, the contents of the royal purse are pretty typical for ladies of a certain age. A mirror, lipstick, mints, and reading glasses. Queen Elizabeth is the only person in Britain who doesn't need a driver's license or a passport since both are issued in her name anyway. During World War II, she was a truck driver for the Army in the Women's Auxiliary Territorial Service, expected to, and able to, do the basic maintenance and repair on the vehicle she was driving. The Queen remains the only female member of the royal family to have entered the armed forces, and is the only living head of state who served in World War II. She still prefers to drive herself whenever possible. When receiving King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, where women have only fairly recently been granted the right to drive, Elizabeth offered him a tour of the estate of Balmoral, Scotland. King Abdullah sat in front with his interpreter behind him and was surprised when Queen Elizabeth hopped into the driver's seat of the Land Rover and took off down the narrow roads, carrying on conversation the entire time. 
The king had never been driven by a woman before and, through his interpreter, begged her to slow down and concentrate on the road. We've talked about a lot of royal death and about Queen Elizabeth, but what happens upon her royal death? Obviously, we can't speak to when or how that may happen, but what happens next has been very carefully planned out. This isn't the sort of thing one leaves to the last minute. London Bridge is down. That is the coded phrase that the Prime Minister will use to tell the Foreign Office's Global Response Center to convey the news to the 15 other governments across the globe of which the Queen is the head of state and the 36 nations of the Commonwealth. A footman, dressed in black, will put a black-bordered notice up on the gates of Buckingham Palace. A special blue light, called the Obit Light, will turn on at radio stations, signaling that the official news of a royal death is on the way, and they will switch to a prepared playlist of somber music. BBC News will be notified using a system originally created to notify them in the case of a nuclear attack. A series of official portraits from throughout the Queen's life will be shown before the announcement begins. This is BBC Television News. Buckingham Palace has just announced the death of the Queen. A black tie is kept on hand at the studio solely for this broadcast. All flags will fly at half-mast, except the royal standard, which must always stay high to symbolize that there is still a living monarch. The BBC will immediately suspend all comedy shows for the official 12-day mourning period, and all radio programming will be changed to situation-appropriate music, with breaks for news every 15 minutes. Days' worth of television retrospectives have been prepared and are constantly being updated. Independent stations ITV and Sky rehearse their death coverage, swapping out the Queen's name with Mrs. Robinson. Prince Charles will have already been sworn in as King and an emergency meeting of Parliament called. Charles will also be confirmed as the head of the Church of England, which could be a sticking point given his divorce. And yes, his wife Camilla could be called Queen, though she would have no right of ascension. The Queen would lie in state in Westminster Hall. Crowd control plans are already in place, having been copied over from the London Olympics. 2,000 guests will be invited to the funeral service at Westminster Abbey. Her coffin will then be taken to Windsor Castle for a private family ceremony before being interred in her family vault. The Queen's death will not only be one of the biggest news stories of the century, but hers will be one of the most expensive deaths. Princess Diana's funeral cost the equivalent of $10 million in the direct funeral expenses alone. There are 36 billion pieces of paper money worldwide with the Queen's likeness on them that will need to be replaced. That's a cost of $200,000 to remint the currency just in the UK, and about a billion dollars in cost worldwide. Some currency undoubtedly will be hoarded by collectors, particularly those minted in the years of her coronation, various jubilees, and her death. The date of her funeral, which will fall 10 days after her death, and the day of the coronation of the new monarch will be declared national holidays, which would each be estimated to have a negative economic impact of $3 billion through lost productivity. Banks and stock exchanges will close for at least that day, and professional sporting events will be canceled. The national anthem will need to be changed back to God Save the King, because it is unlikely England would see another queen for generations. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. But a few more things that worried good old king divorce beheaded died divorce beheaded survived. He was also scared that someone could poison his son's clothing. So every garment intended for Prince Edward would first be washed and aired before a fireplace to remove any potential harmful substances. And before the little princeling could wear any of these items, the servants had to test them. Sometimes they would rub both the insides and outsides of the garments against their skin, or they'd get a boy about Edward's size and make him wear the clothes, and just kind of wait and see if anything bad happened. 
Thankfully, there are no historical accounts of poisoned pantaloons. Thanks for spending part of your day with me, and stay safe.